And uh, we're, we're starting to wrap up a series we've been in called The Heart of Worship. And the series has been all about having an open heart which brings praise, worship, thanksgiving, honour and obedience to God and such a powerful presence we sense of him among us when we're able to bring those things, praise, worship, thanksgiving, honour and obedience. Across this series, we've sought to show you that this often begins with music and that the activation of our body and mind in music through repetition is what actually helps our hearts to become more open and willing to allow God to move us and change us and make us more like him. Now, I don't know if you know this, but next Sunday is our prayer and worship service, our monthly communion prayer and worship service, but it's also Pentecost Sunday. And it's the Sunday marking 50 years since the resurrection of 50 years. Whoops. No, my notes don't say that. I just went off the cuff in my mind. 50 days... Correction, 50 days since the resurrection of Jesus. And in the Bible, it was a momentous day. And our church is built on the belief that God is still wanting to bring day after day of Pentecost into our lives right in the here and now. It's a day of Pentecost type of experience which will turn an open heart of worship into a life of worship which is full of power and purpose. And so we're going to base our message today in the book of Acts and around the story of the day of Pentecost. So we're in Acts chapter 2. If you've got a Bible or an app, we're going to camp ourselves right there in Acts chapter 2 for this morning. Right at the beginning, it says, On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit, and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be? They exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, people from all places, and we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They asked each other. It sounds like an almighty hullabaloo. It sounds like a mess very messy, noisy, undignified, a melting pot of humanity coming together and everyone asking each other all at once, what is happening? I grew up in a church tradition that was suspicious of this kind of activity in church. Unless what was happening was very ordered and everyone knew what to expect, with everyone in the congregation sitting quietly. You're very well behaved today. <laughs> Hopefully if you're at home, you're like dancing around the lounge room or something and shouting at the TV. Everyone in the congregation sitting quietly and listening to the person out the front, which I appreciate, it's very respectful. I learned <laughs> through what was modelled to me to become cynical 
about anything that looked like what this picture would have looked like on the day of Pentecost. And I learned to be particularly suspicious of the whole concept of speaking in tongues. In fact, in the church that I grew up in, there was a bit of a fear about speaking in tongues, but there was definitely a judgment that speaking in tongues was not really of God. And then, I've been in church my whole life. When I was 17, I went on my first overseas short-term mission trip, and I know you've been very curiously wondering what's happening with this. I went to Vanuatu on my very first overseas short-term mission trip and uh, we were there on mission with a bunch of teenagers and uh, we were doing some building works to a church in Vanuatu. And so we were there for a few weeks and while we were there, we had to go to church with the church family that we were supporting with our mission work. Now, this family, the pastor's family, uh, was the only family that really had a proper house in the village Because these people had great honour for God and they had great honour for the people who served God through ministry work. And so these pastors, the pastor's family, gave up their house for the girls on the team to be the only people in the village at that time who had a real bed to sleep in or a real floor to sleep on and a toilet that flushed. Everybody else in the village lived in houses that did not look like that, where people slept on the floor, there was no running water, and people did not have toilets that flushed. And the boys, oh, it sucks to be a boy sometimes, on our team were sleeping in tents in the backyard. I think it's a bit easier to pee in the middle of the night if you're a boy than if you're a girl. And so they were sleeping in tents in the backyard uh, of the house of the minister. So every Sunday we would go to church and this church, (laughs) I mean, sometimes we complain about these chairs, but in these church services we were sitting on a wooden plank about this wide which was suspended between a pile of two bricks, building bricks at each end. So our church pews as such were a piece of timber suspended between bricks on either end. And let me tell you this fun fact. Church in Vanuatu all those years ago, I don't know if it's different now, went for no less than three hours. Three hours of sitting on that plank suspended between those bricks and praising the Lord. These people were an inspiration because they were not bored after three hours, they were singing wholeheartedly, repetitively, over and over the praises and goodness of God. And yes, they were speaking in tongues very loudly. Me, in my youthful arrogance, immaturity, and because of where I'd been raised, at one point in one of these services, I was so disgruntled with what was happening that I got up and walked out of the service in the middle of church because I thought that the way that these people were worshipping was wrong. We finished up our trip and uh, on the very last night they gave us this, they put on this banquet dinner for us, for our team to thank us for what we've, we'd done, which was not much to be honest. And um, And they had made these supremely poor people, had made every member of our team an item of clothing. The girls are dressed like this, beautiful craftsmanship, fabric and lace that they couldn't afford to bless us with a gift as we left. And as we sat around and had this meal, this final feast, Our team leaders were saying to us, make sure that you don't eat too much because these people in their generosity, they can't afford much food. They've brought everything that they can afford to bless you for your final meal. And because you're the guests of honour, they won't eat until you've eaten. So if you eat all of the food, then them and their families won't eat today. And so here I was 
judging the way these people worshipped. And yet, everything about the way that they lived, the way that they outworked their faith in Jesus spoke of godliness, spoke of humility, spoke of honour, spoke of purpose and spoke of generosity. And so I come home and uh, I'm then starting to date a young man and um, it's this one over here. And uh, not long after that, I came to this church as part of a visiting ministry trip to this church. And what I experienced here had some similarities to church that I experienced in Vanuatu. The worship was wholehearted. People were not afraid to get their bodies involved with the worship. It was loud. It was repetitive. There was some loud speaking in tongues from people in the congregation. And uh, I began to see that while these people and then other people across the course of some years looked very similar to me, their worship style showed something different. These spirit-filled Christians were more joyful than me. They seemed more at peace than me. They had a high level of faith and confidence to believe that God was still active and moving in the lives of everyday people. And they literally expected this to happen every day. Where I had always believed I should centre my life around the prayer, thy will be done, and just wait and see what happened, these kinds of Christians were praying the prayer, come Holy Spirit, and actively expecting and pursuing more and more of God's goodness in their lives and the lives of others. These Christians seem to be able to express something so personal about their relationship with God, where I had been raised to follow a set of behaviours to try and remain close to God. I came to believe that there was more of God for me to experience than I had allowed my heart to be open to. And so I repented of my arrogance for thinking (laughs) at 17 years old that I knew everything about God and everything that he had for my life. And I opened my heart and asked to experience more of him. Because a Pentecost experience in your life and my life is preceded by repentance. Pentecost is always preceded by repentance. We repent first. We clean the slate first. And in Acts 2, Peter showed the people that were gathered just that because they were asking questions about what's happening, what is all this noise about, and he reminds them that the day of Pentecost has actually been a part of God's long-range plan right from the beginning, that it doesn't just finish with the birth, death, resurrection and ascension of Jesus, but that Jesus himself told the people that he was going to leave himself, leave a gift for us to experience so that we could carry him with us on purpose and mission into our everyday lives. Peter reminds the people that their human frailty meant that they were a part of the crucifixion because they didn't stand up against the people who had called for Jesus to be crucified. And it says in verse 37, Peter's words pierced their hearts and they said to him and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do then? Now that we know, what should we do? And Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. And be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the Holy Spirit. Then you will receive the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children and to those far away. All who have been called by the Lord our God. In verse 21 it says, But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
the Bible's made it very clear that the way to experience a Pentecost kind of empowering from God is to repent first, to say, I need you, Jesus, first, to say, I believe, Jesus, that you died on the cross to set me free and to wipe my slate clean, to lift my shame, and I'm going to hold on to that promise for the rest of my life. And so this morning, I'm going to give you an opportunity right now to wipe the slate clean. If you're either here in our room or joining us online and today is your day, then you know that today is your day. Just raise your hand and show me who you are. Online, you can just put a hands up emoji or say, that's me, or say yes in the comments and we're going to pray a prayer together. It's as simple as that. Praying a prayer that says, sorry, says, I believe you, Jesus, and says, come and fill me with more of you every day for the rest of my life. Come on, church, let's pray this prayer together. Jesus, this is my decision. Today I say yes to you. You died on the cross to pay the price for my sin. I invite you to be my saviour. Come into my life. Forgive my sin and fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. If you said yes to Jesus, a miracle has just happened. And the second thing that Pentecost is marked by is miracles. How do I know if I've had a Pentecost kind of experience in my life? Well, my life becomes marked by miracles. And so Peter goes on to tell the people in Acts chapter 2 that all of this has actually been prophesied many years beforehand. Let's pick it up in verse 14. Peter stepped forward with the other 11 apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. Side note, you don't have to go to church until 10, so (laughs) bonus. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. Here's what the prophet Joel had written 750 years earlier. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Their lives will become marked by miracles. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. We're going to be praying for you in a moment that if you're not sure that you've received a baptism in the Holy Spirit or you're ready for another day of Pentecost kind of experience today, that you will receive it and you will know that you've received it because your life will become marked by miracles. Maybe it will be speaking in tongues. Maybe it will not. Maybe it will be a gift of healing. Maybe it will be a gift of prophecy and you'll be speaking words of encouragement over every person over a cup of tea after the service. But you will be filled by the Holy Spirit if you ask for that gift this morning. You know, there was this lady who was a part of our church a few years ago. She's since passed on and is living in glory with Jesus. Her name was Sandra. And I love to tell Sandra's story because she came across our path one morning in uh, midweek when our front room was open and she was on her way to Centrelink and she was having a bad day. And she saw the welcome sign on the wall and she thought, these people look, look welcoming. And so she came in. And so Denise and her team made her a cuppa and had a chat and she had had a growing up church experience kind of similar to mine, a bit different, but she had some some cynicism about what church was like in this kind of an environment and, you know, Denise and her team invited her to church and within a couple of weeks she'd come to church and experienced our style of worship and she wasn't quite sure yet whether she wanted to put her hand up and respond and say yes to Jesus but her heart was open and within a couple of weeks, yes, she'd done that. She'd raised her hand. She'd said yes to Jesus and she, was, she had this insatiable hunger, a spiritual hunger and thirst to know and experience more of God. 
And uh, so she got water baptised and she did Beyond Basics so that she could join one of our teams. And at Beyond Basics, uh, we talk about baptism in the Holy Spirit. And she said, I don't know if I've been baptised in the Holy Spirit. And so uh, Luke gave her one of the Alpha films that talks about being baptised in the Holy Spirit and talks about speaking in tongues. And she went home and she watched that. And then we had a service not long after that where we were speaking about the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And we asked, we gave everybody a blank sheet of paper and a lead pencil and just asked them to write down or draw or whatever, um, whatever they felt like the Holy Spirit was inspiring them about. And uh, Sandra came to Luke at the end of that service and she had written a prayer on her piece of paper. And it was a prayer about reconciliation with her daughter and her family. They'd been out of relationship and it was a a cause of tension and brokenness in her heart. And uh, she said to Luke, do you think I've been baptised in the Holy Spirit? And because look at this letter and Luke's like, oh, okay. And she said, no, you're not understanding. I've been given new language. I've been given new words. In my own strength, I'm not able to write these words. I'm not, I'm not even able to spell words correctly. But you're telling me that this letter, this prayer, it makes sense. The words are spelled correctly. They make sense in sentences. She said, I can't do that in my own strength. And Luke said, then yes, of course, you've been baptised in the Holy Spirit. How do you know? If you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, well, you begin to sound different. You're given a new language and a new spirit that looks and sounds more like God. And like Professor Stephen Fogarty told us a couple of weeks ago, you sound more optimistic. You activate the gifts within and believe for them to bring supernatural empowerment and healing to others. And you begin living on purpose as though nothing else matters because Pentecost is proven by a life of purpose. The day of Pentecost type of experience isn't a one-off, but it does change you forever. It makes you more selfless, makes you generous. It reminds you of what's most important so that you're willing to go hungry in order to keep pursuing the things of God in your life. It lights a fire of mission and purpose inside you that you can't ignore and that keeps pointing you toward eternity when you're distracted by the here and now around you. It says at the end of Acts chapter 2 that all the believers, this is the result, this is the aftermath of the day of Pentecost. All the believers, all of them, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, the introverts, And extroverts alike devoted themselves to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, honouring and remembering that sacrifice that had been made on their behalf and to prayer. And a deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had selflessness they sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need they worshipped together in the temple each day some of you complain about coming to church once a week they met together in the temple each day met in homes for the lord's supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity all the while praising god and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Does that sound good? Would you like to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit today? Would you like to experience maybe a fresh day of Pentecost moment in your life? I'm full of faith and expectation that if your heart is open, if you're giving the Lord permission, if you're surrendered, if you're repentant, you've wiped the slate clean, you're giving God due honour in your life, then he's going to bless you with his gift. Your life will be marked by miracles in this moment. 
He's going to light a fire of passion and purpose in you for your future. He's going to come like a rushing wind, like this song we're about to sing now, and wipe, blow out all the cobwebs, blow out all the things that aren't of Him so that you can start fresh. So why don't you stand to your feet because we're going to worship together and Luke's going to help me. We're going to pray for anybody who wants to receive a fresh day of Pentecost today. I know it's not until next week, but God is moving every day and every time we gather. If you're joining us online, why don't you still stand to your feet? It's a mark of honour. It's a mark of obedience. It's a mark of surrender. And we're going to sing together. Look, if you want to receive prayer this morning, come out the front. Be bold. Be brave. Don't be too proud. Be humble enough to come out and say, yeah, I want to have a day of Pentecost experience today. Come on, team. Let's sing this song.